Our world is changing fast. And with this comes the need to keep pace. To create, evolve, and deliver solutions that meet our customers' needs and improve their lives. At Swift, we're collaborating with the brightest minds to make transactions faster, smarter, better. Because we believe some challenges are meant to be solved together. With our community, we're reimagining what we can achieve through innovation. Investing in a new AI platform that will power the creation of smarter solutions. Like real-time anomaly detection to validate transactions before they're sent. We're reaching into the world of central bank digital currencies to reduce fragmentation, connect up technologies, and enable new possibilities for sending digital money across borders. And we're guiding securities players through the emerging world of tokenized assets, increasing the speed and efficiency of post-trade processing to help a new market grow. These innovations will help our community adapt to finance's ebbs and flows, not just to stay afloat, but to thrive and lead both today and in the future. But we're not embarking on this journey alone. We're encouraging our community to join us too, to innovate with us, and be part of shaping the future of finance. Faster. Smarter. Better. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our ninth edition of Inside Innovation Live, a series of shows where we explore the exciting innovations happening across financial services. I'm Nick Kerrigan, Head of Innovation at SWIFT, and today we're looking at how the industry can unlock the potential of tokenized assets. And to do this, I'm very privileged to be joined by Anurag Soin, Director of Digital Asset Services at Australia and New Zealand Banking Group Limited. Anurag, very warm welcome to the show. Thanks, Nick. Um, so to start us going, could you tell us a little bit about your role at, uh, at ANZ? Yeah, my, my role is a, is a really fun role at ANZ. So my role basically focused on build all these amazing smart contracts, compile them, uh, take them through an audit process. And once there is no high, critical, medium, low risk, uh, deploy on the blockchain wow. and that everything which is involved in the middle so pretty pretty cool job that's pretty cool an end-to-end -end view of all of the, all of this so um i think you're going to have some you you know pretty unique insights for us in in this converse conversation uh before we get into that and get into the details um it's great to see so many of you joining us today uh on the linkedin live stream um i can see there are about 130 or so people who've already joined um so uh, as always do feel free to ask questions in the stream and we'll try to get to them uh, as many uh, many of those questions as as possible during uh, during this conversation so uh, to get us going, Anurag, um, let, let's talk about a bit about tokenized assets and, and, and the journey that we, we've sort of been on as an industry so far. I'm mean, obviously in this interest in tokenized uh, assets. Tokenization has grown exponentially across financial services in, in recent years. And firms are starting to view, uh, you know, regulated tokens as a potential you know, new source of value. So um, maybe you could share a bit about the journey that ANZ has been on in developing uh, digital assets and the digital assets business. Yeah, the, the journey started actually uh, with a customer coming and asking that we have banked with you for around 200 years, um, how you're gonna bank us in, in the world of digital assets? And when that question was asked, uh, we immediately realized that there are a few things which we need to develop. Um, to support our customers in this new uh, world of digital assets. So first was like wallet infrastructure. You can't interact in Web3 if you don't have a wallet infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we are like, so what we do about it? Let's go build it. Uh, so that's exactly what we have done. The step one, let's build an institutional grade wallet infrastructure 
so we can help our customer transact in the world of web3 mm-hmm. the moment we have built the wallet infrastructure we are like ah so they have to transact value so what we have to do next and then we decided to build anz uh, 8 dollar dc stablecoin uh, which is a erc20 smart contract which is all the compliance features of blacklisting access control everything which you think from a institutional player to have so we built it we took it through amazing audit with with open zeppelin and guess what no critical high or medium vulnerabilities and then then we have deployed onto the the main net and very proud to say we transacted 30 million as our first wow. first transaction um and the philosophy of the team has been learn by doing Mm, so we mm. we built the wallet infrastructure we have built our stable coin and by doing that we have realized that stable coin is good but we need to then have capability of tokenizing other assets mm, and that's mm. where our journey took us to um, mm. and finally we ended up building a tokenization engine which then allows to tokenize real world assets and also a marketplace which then help transact these assets with the stable coin so it's been a journey of everything led by a customer demand Yeah. Um yeah. I'm proud yeah. to say we are reactive but we are fast reactive. <laughs> well, I think that's a, that's a really pretty cool place to be because you saw the initial signs of customer demand, what you might call the initial sig- or weak signals, right? And you started to innovate and respond to them and, and as an innovator i love that journey where you sort of you 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 know you you, you see a need you, you build something and then it there's further need emerges and then you build again and you keep kind of you know doing that sort of uh you know that that sort of uh you know iterate test learn and develop again and and keep that 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 kind of wheel rolling um you you mentioned sort of you know tokenized tokenized assets and and uh and the you know the demand that you see coming uh around real world assets I, and i guess there is a bit of a debate about you know which assets are really going to be tokenized um you know is it going to be the ones that are more established as securities today or is it going to be ones that uh maybe uh you know where there are challenges at the moment say around you know ease of transferring or liquidity and those kind of things what what's your view on this which ones will have the potential to scale do you think um i i think it's less of my view but actually um our boss's view nigel dobson's view that uh, we will see faster adoption in the markets um which have high friction mm-hmm. and and the new markets the reason mm-hmm. for that is um they don't have that force of um incumbents mm. and also there is incentives for these markets to evolve on new infrastructure to deliver that value example carbon mm. Mm. Uh, we, we yeah. definitely have a very strong view as an organization um that nature based assets are are very very well placed um to then lead the wave of tokenization in the world of digital assets um i have uh, personally i have one other view uh, which is uh markets which have really complex workflows mm, mm. will be the next ones which will be ready for tokenization just because of the efficiency it will provide um because as the information flow is coupled with value flow mm. uh, the possibilities are endless uh, and i believe that a combination of those two will drive the, the early waves of tokenization ultimately everything will be tokenized that's my view uh, but it will start there Yeah 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 and that's an interesting point about about benefits right i mean you think about you think about workflows and then you think about being able to embed the workflows in the smart contracts right and that's that's where you can see you can see an angle there that okay that you know that there's a level of automation and efficiency that can be gained um that that you know maybe takes out uh you know transactional costs but also allows uh you know greater greater access what what do you think are some of the other benefits that that tokenization could could deliver you know i guess both for you know, the perspective of anz but also the the wider industry right yeah um so i think tokenization will actually gain from this mega trend which mm-hmm. is at the moment we are in a node based or edge based economy Yeah. their assets sits on the edges in the databases mm-hmm. and then they have to transact as swift you guys know this better correct information <laughs> has to flow then value has to flow and then everything has to reconcile so i yeah. think as this phenomena will play out where assets will move away from edges to the network mm-hmm. the moment you move the edges from edges to the network that gives you all the advantages of 
improve settlement, reduce counterparty risk, atomic settlement. So I think tech tokenization will gain that advantage of moving to a network model than the edge model. Mm -hmm. The other big one I will say is the moment you moved it to the network, all your programmatic workflow across enterprises can happen in one transaction. I think we we are just starting to see that. And, and mm -hmm. Nick, you are a big believer in uh, CCIP and transaction flow with value flow, I know. Um, and we have seen, correct, at a press of a button, how you can have like yeah. four transactions across multiple blockchains. Right. Um, trigger and get executed either all of it or none of it. That's powerful. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and the ability to tie those together, right, and and to see them happening in a in a synchronized way. I I, I agree with you. I think that's inc that's incredibly uh, that's incredibly powerful. I, I guess we're at, as you said, we're sort of at the I wouldn't say we're at the start of this. We're still in the early stages of it, right? Where it's sort of at that. You know, I always think about the sort of S curve of adoption, and we're sort of at that sort of where where the, where it's starting to accelerate, but it isn't quite yet at the sort of takeoff takeoff point and indeed we see that right in the market cap of regulated tokens which is still relatively small especially compared with with sort of uh, less regulated things like sort of uh, like sort of crypto assets and I guess some of the things that limit the, the market growth are, are sort of the operational challenges right because um, you know you're we, we'd all love to bring all these assets to the network as you as you said um, but then the question is which which network right and and there's a diverse range of blockchains at them uh, at, at the moment so I, I'm curious for your view about you know where do you think the 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 you know the 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 blockchain ecosystem for institutions currently stands and you know how does block how do public blockchains play into that mix yeah none of this is financial advice yeah because if i end up taking <laughs> a blockchain name and people started putting money on that that would be a problem we, we um, are exactly the same right so, <laughs> <laughs> so um first of all like that's a pretty bulky question. So I will try to answer it in few parts, correct? Okay. Where is the ecosystem today? Yeah. And then opportunities and challenges. Let's let's try to skin the cat in the three, three yeah. buckets. Um, so if, if you look at institutional ecosystem and it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So we have a bunch of institutions who are trying to have their own network, public permission networks, and they have the valid reasons to have that. Then we have few organizations who are coming together and then jointly working on a network of private permission networks. Mm -hmm. um, which again has advantages. Mm -hmm. And then on the right side, you have um, organizations like us who are experimenting with, you can have all that permissioning, but at a smart contract level, but on a public network. Mm -hmm. And the way each of these different models are basically, they, they all have their valid reasons to manage the risk at a different level. Um, that how you manage access control and things like that. So I think mm -hmm. everyone has taken their own view on this um we have we have a view then when we look at the opportunity side of that right spectrum is um and again i'm quoting nigel he he says this really well that when we were transacting a stable coin it was really fast hmm. in terms of building we don't have to take care of all that stack of technology so if you have to build a highly available, secure network of technology, it costs money. You will know that. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, uh, very well. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, as all the, also all the banks that, you know, that, that are connected to SWIFT know, uh, you know, very, very, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's a top of mind topic, right? Exactly. And now what public blockchains do really, really well is they abstract away all that complexity of lower level of infrastructure. Mm. And only thing you are trusting is the math. If the Merkle route of this block to this block has the valid transaction, you're good. Mm -hmm. So in, in that manner, that's the opportunity which public blockchain win, which is this layer of global infrastructure where you have to just trust in the math. You don't have to trust an individual. So it sounds really good, but everything which has advantages has some challenges. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, I don't say we have solved all of them, but we are on a journey of solving some of them. Now, when we think about challenges, we have to think from a mindset perspective and the evolution of the space as well. Mm -hmm. From mindset perspective, when, when today when we build any application, we think about first layer of defense, uh, who can hit my load balancer of application. Then from load balancer, we only allow traffic to go to a service or an API. Mm -hmm. And from there, 
only few things talk to a database. Guess what? Blockchain has turned on side. The database is there and is visible to everyone. Yes. Uh, yeah. You control all your value by having a right smart contract, right token design. And if there's flaws in that, it's a very highly adversarial environment and very smart people looking to exploit it. Mm, mm, mm. So when we require a mind shift in terms of how you operate in such a highly adversarial environment, but also have the controls to mitigate against some of them. Mm. Um, and I will say a lot of these we have seen in action, correct? With enterprises, blacklisting wallets, sure. burning the balances and exercising those controls. So it's possible. Yeah, uh, It's not 100%, but it's possible. Second challenge which we have to think about is as technology is changing, our obligations don't change. Right. If we right. have obligation to offer right product to the right customer, we can't say we don't know who is the entity behind this wallet and guess what? We have given this to everyone. We can't do that right, right, as right. mature organizations. So when we three the evolution, web one, good, read done, web two, read write done, uh, web three, value done, but still web three hasn't solved for identity. Right. Um, and I'm not saying solved, like there are many solutions out there. We soul bound token in a wallet, which gives you identity versus verified credential, but how we have like token standards today, identity standards are still missing. Mm -hmm. And I believe with, with Mika coming out and making some of those things clear, I think we will see a faster change in that area. Um, and the other big one is digital assets have just like exploded. So you have a digital asset which is 50 cents. Um, that the sword in the game, which is very valuable to me, mm -mm. whereas we have a fifty million dollar bond, right? Yeah, yeah. And these assets are transacting on so many different chains that the success of area has also created a lot of problems mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. these things, these economies, have to interact with each other. And guess what? Blockchains don't interact with each other most of the time. Right, right. So right. I, I think. Um, as an organization, there's a lot of mind shift and operational risk side of things, which we have to think about when we are looking at the challenges of this pub public ecosystem. Like which chains you're going to support? What's right. uh, what's your operating model around them? Right, and 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 I think that's a that's a key point, right? Isn't it? The 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 I, I love the way you put it. You know, the obligations don't change no matter what you know what the technology is that sits behind it, and the way you maybe have to instantiate some of those controls that you know you require from an institutional uh, setting that may be quite different in a in a in a blockchain environment, particularly a public blockchain environment, because if if you're in a private environment, it's much easier. You can sort of you could effectively port across your controls and say, look, I've done I've done all these things um, and and kind of demonstrate that. Whereas um, in a public in you know blockchain environment, it requires a bit of a bit of a, a mind shift uh, there. And and I see I don't know what what you see, but I or I see different kind of blockchains being used for different use cases as well both by sort of size of transaction, but also thinking about, you know, payments versus securities versus trade, for example, you know, um, in, in the sort of central bank CBDC kind of world, you know, seems to be much more of a focus on the private chains, whereas I think, you know, it feels like in the sort of securities and trade space that there's more um, a, ability to explore the use of, of, of public blockchains. But I think that right. that, that then means that we are, uh, likely to see, uh, you know, a certain amount of of, of market fragmentation here, um, and I wonder what what how you see the, the the implications of that potentially of that market fragmentation. Yeah, so I think uh, implications are the promise of uh, digital asset space is all about efficiency. Right. So if you take just one practical example, that if a digital asset has total liquidity of billion dollar, and if it is spread across hundred blockchains you have significantly reduced the depth of the liquidity. Right. Uh, guess what? In an AMM model, your, your pricing is adversely impacted. So efficiency of the market has gone mm -mm. Like, mm -mm. like this. So I think that's the first lens which we have to think about, which is that liquidity fragmentation problem. Other uh, very big one is the operational nature. If you are mm -hmm. an issuer of asset, um, are you going to build your own interoperability solutions across networks. And guess what? Mm -hmm. It's not easy. And mm -hmm. guess what? It's really high risk. We have seen right. multiple exploits right. which have happened, correct? So yeah, yeah. Um, these these things are hard at its core. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 then I think that that's you know that's where the, the question of, of interoperability really comes into play, isn't it? Because we we've got a 
if we assume that there are going to be many different chains out there, right, how are we going to actually kind of be able to to, to link those together in a, in a secure way, right? Um, and, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, you know, the multiple, you know, well-known kind of situations with with bridges and other things that, are, that have happened. So the risk is very, is very real. Um, so it's, it, you know, we've got to find a way, and I think that's that. That, that for me is key: find a way of, of of ensuring that we can deliver the promised efficiency gains while ena enabling that the, those efficiency gains in a kind of you know multi-chain world. Is that is that how you see it too, Anurag? That's the exact reason why we decided to join um, the the pilot, which was run by Swift. Correct? That we believe the the world is going to be multi-chain. Um, and we have tested that out by deploying our tokens on multiple networks. And yes, there are a lot of challenges which we have to solve. At the same time, as you're deploying these assets on multiple networks, you have to think about how the value and information will flow together. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the thinking of Swift and um, in, in this case with ANZ is very much aligned. That world is multi-chain. How we make that multi-chain work is going to be a critical question for us to answer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's then turn to talk a bit about the the experiments we've been we've been doing uh, to, together that were recently um, recently announced. We we've been uh, working together with yourselves and over a, a dozen other financial institutions from around the world uh, to really try and find that that potential interoperability model and also looking at how those uh, those SWIFT members can leverage their existing uh, SWIFT infrastructure to instruct the transfer of tokenized value over, over a, a range of, of both private and, and public uh, networks. Um, from an ANZ perspective, I mean, what, why did you join the experiment and, and what insights were you in particularly were you looking to gain? Because obviously you've done, you've done quite a lot, a lot of work in this area already. Yeah, so I think the, the best part about this, this experiment has been not just from technical perspective, hmm. um, but, but having a thinking across legal, operational, compliance considerations. And in the experiment, we have these tracks where um, we have debated a lot. One such example, which was finally, we, we led to a conclusion that what is the liability model when you are doing, for example, lock and mint, Yes. in an interoperatively model versus burn and mint. Is it a liability of protocol? Is it a liability of, of the user? And how different models lead to different surface area of risks mm -hmm. and how we can manage and monitor them. So I think given when you believe the world is multi-chain, you can't ignore the surface area of risk. And we are a pretty much a risk first organizations that sure. we look at every problem, try to identify the risk and see what are the controls which we can build for these. And it was really, really good to have like-minded organizations coming together and talking about how we can manage this, how we can make this secure. So I would say yeah. we have achieved a lot. Still, yeah. there are a few areas which we can work on further um, and looking forward for it. Yeah, I mean, likewise, and 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 as we put together this experiment, I mean, we we were also very conscious. Um, you know, we needed to have a work stream that looked at the technical solution because that was extremely important. Equally, we're also, as, as you know, we're, we're really passionate about the sort of second work stream where we looked at non-technical considerations and things like legal liability and recourse, things like business process and operational system, and obviously data was a big one uh, as. As, as well, and I think that 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 to me is where the power of these collaborative experiments kind of come in, because you're actually getting institutions together who've been exploring in different ways and have built up different knowledge bases, getting those shared, and you can actually get an awful long way in in, in quite a short um, a, sh a short period period of time. How did you like? How did you construct the team to address this and bring your sort of you know your A team to bear in this experiment? Uh, we, we call it ninja team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so at, at ANZ, uh, we have a core digital assets team, right. which is supported by amazing partners from risk, compliance, fin crime. It's, it's a coalition of willing. Um, so pretty much it supports our operating model, which is every use case. You need to go through a build process, risk assessment process, approval process, regulatory engagement process, and then, then getting deployed on mainnet. Right. So to support that, we have a core team um, which which is focused on led by Richard Schroeder, and basically three key pillars are there within within the team. 
Um, so first pillar is around making sure that we are consistently engaging with partners and regulators. So it, it's led by a reg regulatory lead. Um, on the second pillar, it's really, really important to operate this business effectively. Um, so we have the operations lead who take care of so many things. Um, so when you think about uh, ANZ was the distributor for, or actually is a distributor for CBDC mm. um, for all the use cases in Australia. Right. Uh, we ended up um, supporting 80% of the use cases. So guess what? You require to onboard them, support them, right. making sure their operations are going well. So then regulatory lead, operations lead, and the third, me, um, who, who takes care of the product and building. So overall, we, we work together to then form that entire operating model um, supported by pretty senior uh, stakeholder engagement by Richard and Nigel. That's amazing. And, and and you can clearly see, I think, in that, right, the cross-functional nature of this. And it's like, I mean, in a way, digital assets are no, are no different from any other product. You need to assemble the complete skill set in order to, to, to deploy um, successfully. So, it was great collaboration in in the experiment, and ANZ's contribution was 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 fantastic alongside uh, the other participants. So now the experimentation is drawing to a close. We obviously expect to to publish the results report later in the year. I, wondering what your impressions were of, of of the kind of solution that we were looking at and, and the approach to enabling transactions across blockchains. Yeah, the, the approach, if I have to summarize in one line, was all around building an institutional grade network of networks mm, mm, mm. because as i said the risks don't change and or the liabilities don't change when you're operating on a new technology so in the experiment when we are thinking about interoperability and we're applying a thinking of rate limiting right we're applying a thinking of risk monitoring fraud network on token transfer what happens in the case of cross transfer and token failure what are the mechanism so i think it was really really focused on that institutional grade mindset for interoperability. Right. And the other really important thing is it is was focused on reducing the barriers to entry. What I mean by that? Mm -hmm. So in, in the digital asset space, you have organizations with various level of sophistications. You have organizations who have their wallet infrastructure, Web3 teams, smart contracts. There's organizations which are just starting on the journey and don't have any of that. And, and the beauty of this project was you can transact in digital assets without worrying about gas cost, without having your wallet infrastructure. You can have an HSM in the existing Swift environment and you can do everything what a mature organization may do themselves. So I think it's that reducing the, the barriers to entry was, was really critical as well. Yes, and, and we were very keen to do that because we know, as you rightly said, different organizations will be different levels of maturity and many organizations, even if they're quite well advanced, still want to use their existing uh, interactions with, with Swift through messaging to be able to, to instruct uh, you know, value to, 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 to move. So um, conscious of time, I, I guess, what, what was your main takeaway from the project? What do you see as the path forward now, Anurag? Yes, we are time crunched. Two dot points then. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> information okay. flow has to go with value flow. Um, yeah. And that was the, the key takeaway to make things interoperable. And only by industry-led engagement, we will able to bring potentially next billion people to blockchain because the transaction happens without them worrying about where it's happening. So those are my uh, cool. Cool. How do we bring the next billion people to blockchain? I love. I love that. Uh, I love that that point. Um, with with that, I'm going to take two questions from the audience. We're, we are almost at the, the bottom of the hour, but two two really interesting questions have come in. So uh, we're going to we'll, we'll cover those. Uh, we'll cover those off. Um, first question comes from from Yusuf. Uh, Yusuf, Yusuf Dombrovsky. Yusuf, thank you very much for your question. Yusuf asks Anurag. Do you believe retail consumers will be exposed to tokenized um, assets, or do you see tokenization only exposed to asset managers and then users then interacting through some kind of front end that, that they're providing? Really, really, really good question. Um, and when I think about it, there are a few lenses we have to apply here. The first lens is, do we believe that wallet technology is going to evolve at a speed where it will make it easy for the end consumer without worrying 
to hold the tokens. Example, if we end up with um, wallet abstraction becoming a reality, then with social recovery and things like that, mm -hmm. and people don't have to remember their seed yeah. phrases, signing can happen, they don't have to worry about gas. If all of that becomes true in the near future, then yes, we will see more people hold, holding their own wallets and things like that. But that will take some time. Mm. In the meantime, solutions like ANZ wallet infrastructure, which we provided to all the use cases as part of RBA pilot, users can log in into using 2FA um, email credentials, they feel comfortable, and then more of custodian model will evolve. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's no one way it, it will grow organically and we will see there are users for both potentially. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's I'm sure that's right. I think then also in that context, getting the user experience right, because, you know, people and, and I do this personally, right, people want want to gain the benefits and maybe explore some of these new asset classes, but they also have expectations around ease and convenience and security that that are in you know, ported from their existing banking and payments experiences, and those don't go away. You know, people yeah. don't don't want to accept a, a clumsy experience just because it's some some new some new thing. So, so I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, there will be there will be different ways we'll interact. Um, I'm going to also take Jerry's uh, question. Jerry, thank you for your your question. A very different question. So, um, Jerry asks about um, the 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 BIS um, and Bank of England project Rosalind, the recent uh, project Rosalind that was w w that was done, um, where they they uh, interoperated a broad variety of, of networks and, and organizations through a centrally orchestrated API type layer. And um, Jerry's asking, you know, what, what your thoughts on that type of mo uh, model are. Yeah, I think when you think about interoperability, it's pretty simple. Blockchain by themselves don't talk to each other. Right. You can have one, one API, which connects the two. You can have um, a side chain or a blockchain in between, which talk to both. You can have... Um, an oracle of networks, which is what was used mm -hmm. as part of this um, experiment where you don't rely on that centralized party for that Merkle root verification. So it's mm -hmm. all about what trust assumptions are required between two chains. If both chains are very highly trusted, mm -hmm. then maybe your trust assumptions are lower and API right. is a more cost effective, faster way of operating. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you want to have um, a model where there's a decentralized network which guarantees the provenance of message and the Merkle route across the network, then maybe an Oracle-based network which is used in this design is, is more appropriate. So I don't think there's a right answer to that. It's based on what are the trust assumptions between the two systems and what level of resiliency you're looking at. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a great point. And that's certainly also how we see it at Swift, right? We're not tied to any one model and, and potentially we'll see multiple models depending on the, the networks involved, probably depending also on the use cases involved and what customers are trying to achieve with those uh, with those use case use cases. Um, so, we, you know, as we've done in, in this experiment, we're very open to exploring that kind of uh, that Oracle based protocol kind of approach. Um, but also in other situations, we, we've also uh, you know experimented with, uh, with 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 other models. Um, so, uh, any final thoughts you want to you want to uh, leave us with Anurag before we close out this session? We are a little over time, but it's been fascinating. Uh, thanks, um, thanks for inviting. And as I said, by only wide industry engagement, we will able to solve the remaining hurdles as we are moving in this direction. So we are really, really looking forward and big thanks to the entire Swift and the Chainlink team for working and inviting all of us to then build the solution. So big thanks. It's been a it's been a pleasure. Um, it's been a, an excellent collaboration in the experiment, and we look forward to to going forward together. Thanks so much, Anurag, for joining me for for this excellent session. That is uh, unfortunately all we've ha got time for today. It's absolutely flown by in, in thirty four minutes. Um, uh, with that, uh, before we go, um, I just like to remind everyone uh, that registrations are open for teams to join 
uh, Swift 2023 uh, hackathon. Um, you can see uh, the the uh, the title of the hackathon on the screen now. You can scan the QR code if you're interested. This year we are unleashing innovation for a sustainable future. Um, by inviting teams to help the industry better meet its ESG goals and in particular uh, be able to deploy uh, AI to help us uh, meet our ESG goals. So uh, registrations for the hackathon close on the 19th of July. Please don't miss this chance to showcase uh, your company's innovation capabilities at Cybos this year. With that, uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, and we'll close the session. Join us again for LinkedIn Live.